many through our Belgian activities. Uh, so Tony is going to give us a lot of information, I'm sure, about his work, about the future of churches, and of course the implications which has for us as well. Thank you, Tony. Thank you also for coming up here uh, all this way. This is the first time, this is the furthest north we've had our annual conference. We do appreciate you coming from. Church Estates Commissioner is a, a, a position that we could only have in our kind of rather curious constitution whereby the Church of England is sort of, you know, the established church and the Queen is both um, supreme governor of the Church of England and head of state. And so the second Church Estates Commissioner is the link between Parliament and the Church of England. A task I did for uh, five years and I never expected that in Five years of my time in Parliament, I'd be dealing with sort of bats, blasphemy, and bishops. Um, and I think the most surreal moment was working out where Richard III should be buried. And there was something of a bidding competition between uh, various members of Parliament, not just York, but um, when John Mann from Bassett Law started claiming that Richard III really ought to be buried in Bassett Law, I realized, you know, this is. So I, um, I did a check, so I wanted to work out which other kings and queens we were missing. And um, I was able to say, Mr. Speaker, I can report to the House, I have done a check, and I can account for every king and queen of England where they're buried, except for Henry III, um, who is um, buried in, was buried at Battle Abbey, and um, uh, who was lost during the dissolution of the monasteries. So we've lost him somewhere in Reading. Um, at which point a voice, somewhat sotte voce, a few rows behind me said, well, he's probably still caught up in the Reading traffic contraflow system. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I, uh, I took through Parliament the legislation relating to uh, women bishops and uh, various other things of that kind, and I found myself um, slightly strangely being made only the, the made a lay canon of Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford, only the second lay canon since the Reformation, and I was looking forward to um, uh, retirement from Parliament, and um, I was summoned by Archbishop Justin, and I couldn't quite work out what I'd done to upset Archbishop Justin. Anyway, he then said, would I um, take on the chairmanship of the uh, Church Buildings Council, which is a sort of um, organization with a pretty dull name, but which is effectively the statutory body which looks after the care and maintenance of all 16,000 uh, parish churches in England. And my mother had given me, actually when I was a child, my mother gave me some very bad advice. Looking back on it, it was a very bad advice. She advised me, she told me that whenever one was asked to do something, you should do it with a good grace. Actually reflecting, that wasn't very good advice because when Archbishop Justin asked me whether I'd take on this task, remembering my mother's advice, I said, of course, Archbishop, which was not actually looking back on it, a very sensible answer, when one then realized that one had to be concerned about the care and maintenance of all 16,000 uh, parish churches. Anyway, that is what brings me here 
today. Uh, can I just also, before I start, give a slight apology um, to the Scottish um, change ringers, because, of course, my remit um, only extends in England. Uh, I have no responsibilities now uh, in Scotland. I did once as a minister. I was responsible as a minister for energy for Scottish, had, and, and also um, uh, minister of state for farming and fisheries, which spent, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, Scottish, the Scottish fishing industry. But I have uh, no responsibility in Scotland whatsoever. So um, this is a rather um, English-centric talk, and I hope uh, Scottish colleagues will apologize for that, although I am half Scots. Uh, my mother was called Oina Patterson. You can't get much more Scottish than that. Anyway, um, everyone um, involved with the Church of England um, has the desire to proclaim the gospel, spread the good news of the gospel story, uh, for the Church of England to be a national church with a presence in every parish and every part of the country. To have clergy responsible for the care and cure of souls for every parish and that any child can be baptized, any couple married, any person buried according to the rights of the Church of England. Across the country, there are many church congregations that are growing. Churches which on Sundays regularly have congregations of hundreds of people many of whom are very often young adults finding the Christian faith for the first time. A significant number of cathedrals report increasing numbers of people attending their services. But we need to have a reality check on where we stand overall. From the time of the arrival of St. Augustine in England until now, the largest regular attendance at Church of England services on Sundays were in the reign of King Edward VII in 1906. In 1906, some 30% of the population in England regularly attended Church of England services. The subsequent 100 years has seen a steady but persistent decline in attendance at Church of England services. So today, approximately 3% of the population in England regularly attend Church of England services on a Sunday, and this increases to 6% at Christmas. When the Queen was crowned at Westminster in 1953, it was possible to describe England as a Christian society. Somewhere between then and now, we have become a post-Christian society. And the statistical evidence suggests that the overall decline in church attendance continues. Now, concern about church attendance is not some new phenomenon. T.S. Eliot's poems of the 1920s comment on the emptiness of city churches that he observes are now used only for society weddings, and that at the weekends, people would rather gallant off to Maidenhead or Hindhead for enjoyment and relaxation. Just as there has been a steady decline over time in church congregations, so too there has been a decline and a continuing decline in the number of Church of England clergy. And this notwithstanding the very welcome ordination of women priests some decades ago now, and a not insignificant number of people coming into the church later in life as self-supporting ministers. The squeeze on clergy numbers is likely to get tighter over the next 10 years or so, as a not insignificant proportion of Church of England clergy are due to retire in the coming decade. There are 16,000 Anglican church buildings in England and 7,000 stipendiary clergy. So even if one takes into account self-supporting ministers, it is self-evident that many clergy are responsible for more than one church. Indeed, the way in which the Church of England has squared the circle 
of on the one hand maintaining a parish system so that everyone lives in their own local parish with the local parish church whilst at the same time having fewer clergy is the introduction of the system of benefices. Clergy nowadays are rarely appointed to be a priest to a single church and in a single parish, but rather are appointed by a bishop to a benefice which will contain a number of parishes, each with its own parish church and all with their own expectations. So that for many parish priests, their church buildings have often become burdens and not blessings, particularly when they have to spend large amounts of their time being concerned about major fundraising projects to maintain the fabric of their church buildings. Under the leadership of Archbishop Justin and the Archbishop of York, the Church of England and every diocese is taking all possible initiatives to grow the church in their area. The church commissioners have made extra funds available for diocesan projects intended to grow the church. Different dioceses are taking different initiatives. And as I've already observed in many churches across the country, we are seeing congregations grow, sometimes dramatically. And I think the last statistics that I saw indicated that one in three Church of England congregations is growing. But the reality is that because of a combination of either the numbers attending church services or clergy having to, come to cover a number of churches in their benefice, there are many Church of England churches that at the moment are used no more than once or twice a month. And the challenge of our church buildings is not helped by history. There have been, broadly speaking, two significant periods of church building in England. The first was from the Norman Conquest of 1066 to the year of the Black Death of 1348. The Normans were invaders and like all invaders wished to lay claim to the land which they had invaded. And the Normans introduced new land laws to England. Indeed so entrenched were those land laws that they persisted until the Law of Property Acts of 1925. And one of their means of occupation was the introduction of the manorial system. Lords of the manor had pretty much complete control over the budget and wealth and the GDP of their manor, providing that they sent the requisite amounts of taxation to the crown. And lords of the manor used much of that wealth over a period of time to build often beautiful but large and impressive parish churches. And the location of these churches reflected the wealth of medieval England, often agriculturally rich areas such as Norfolk or Herefordshire, the Wolds of Lincoln or the riches of the Cotswolds. But the result is that the large majority of English parish churches are today in rural areas in which a minority of the population live. The second major period of church building was immediately after the Napoleonic Wars, when in 1818, Parliament set up a commission to build new churches in the newly arising industrial towns and cities of England. Parliament provided funds for new church building, which meant there were few major towns and cities which did not see new churches being built to meet the needs of expanding industrial towns. Usually such churches were built in town centers but over time, from Accrington to Wolverhampton, the population of these towns has moved out from the town centre to housing estates, leaving town and city centre churches without immediate communities. Matters are made more complicated by the fact that just under three quarters of grade one listed buildings in England are churches. Now, as I've said, I chair the Church Buildings Council which is a statutory body responsible for the care and maintenance of parish churches. Where along with everyone else in the church, we seek, seek to get the balance right as between heritage and mission and try to ensure sufficient flexibility for churches to adapt 
provide a wider range of community services and activities, whilst at the same time not undermining the heritage, which invariably is the oldest a continuous building uh, in any particular community. As you'll have gathered, there are a lot of circles here to square. And one initiative that we are taking forward is that of festival churches. Now, for the avoidance of doubt, and in big capital letters, I would like to stress that the purpose of festival churches is to seek to keep churches open, to keep parish churches open for baptisms, weddings, and funerals, to keep them open for key services during the year, and to keep them open as a continuing, continuing witness of Christian mission in their community. The idea of festival churches is very straightforward. These should be churches which are not needed for weekly church services, where there will be half a dozen services during the year, which seek to involve as many from the local community as possible. The collections and money raised at those festival churches can be applied for the basic upkeep of the church, the cost of paying insurance and ensuring that the guttering is regularly cleaned and maintained. Now, it's not for us, Church Buildings Council, or anyone to decide which churches should become festival churches. That is a matter for parishes themselves in discussion and consultation with the local deanery and their diocesan pastoral committee. All we are seeking to do is to provide a range of options, all intended to try and ensure that churches can be properly cared for and maintained. And given the diversity of our island's history, and given the diverse geography of parish churches, there is no one-size-fits-all solution for maintaining our church buildings. In some instances, the solution will be festival churches. For others, it may be adapting the building to provide opportunities for community involvement. Anything from a village, including the village shop and post office, providing space for a creche, playgroup, or lunch club for the elderly, or space for concerts. In some instances, the answer may be in passing responsibility and ownership from the parochial church council to a community trust. And again, the Church Buildings Council, in discussion with church lawyers, is seeking to ensure how we can make that option easier uh, for an open church. General Synod is taking three initiatives which I suspect will help parishes, parochial church councils, deanery synods, diocesan mission and pastoral committees, and others focus on how each individual church building might best be used. Firstly, every diocese is being asked to carry out a strategic review of its church buildings. Which churches does it need to invest money in for which churches does it need to invest money in for major repair and renovation? Which church buildings does it wish to see used regularly? And which church buildings could become festival churches? And indeed, which churches does the diocese consider may need to be closed altogether? This obviously will need, as with everything else in the Church of England, to be a combination of a bottom-up parish-led initiative, whilst at the same time being coordinated by the diocese. Some dioceses have already carried out such strategic reviews, so, for example, the Diocese of Carlisle recently carried out a comprehensive review of all their church buildings, which found, amongst other things, that they estimated that over the next decade, they will probably need to actually close about 3% of the churches in the diocese. Secondly, General Synod took two decisions at the February meeting of General Synod that affect canon and church law. The first was to effectively regularize what in many of the parts of the country is already the case, but to make it clear that it is not necessary for various church services, known historically as offices, to be said or sung in open churches every Sunday. A move which, of course, amongst other things, means that it will be lawful to have churches where only a limited number of services are celebrated during the course of the year. And thirdly, General Synod has agreed to bring forward legislation which will enable a benefice to effectively have a single benefice council rather than as at present, where a priest with responsibility for a benefice 
has a separate PCC for every parish within the Benefice. And I suspect that in due course, when the le that legislation is finally passed by General Synod, and when we start to see Benefice councils or a Benefice-wide administration dis administrative decision-taking body, that those living and worshipping in the Benefice will collectively decide which church buildings they wish to use on a regular weekly basis and which church buildings they may want to use less regularly. So for the avoidance of doubt, there is nothing here that is going to be imposed from above. What both General, general, what both general Synod and the Church Buildings Council are seeking to do is to provide parishes, PCCs and dioceses with the means and with the maximum flexibility to ensure the best and most appropriate use of each and, and every existing church building, and insofar as is possible, to seek to ensure that each church building can generally be a blessing to the community in which it finds itself, and not a burden, either to the community or to the incumbent or to the wider church. Now, church bells and bell ringing, there is, of course, something quintessentially English and Anglican about the tradition of church bells and bell ringing, which does so much to enrich the experience of people from city, town, and village. So, for me, whether it be hearing the bells at St. James Garlic Hive or St. Vida's Foster Lane in the city of London, or a peal of bells being rung at a town centre church such as St. Mary's Banbury, or hearing the bells rung or practiced next door to where I live at St. Mary's Bloxham, where the bells date back to the 16th century, the oldest still being rung cast somewhere around 1579. Church bells are for many a part of the tapestry of English religious witness and worship, and people have been enjoying bell music across the land for a very long time. Not for nothing did John Betjeman, who incidentally served as a member of the Oxford Di Diocese DAC for some 23 years and titled one of his autobiographical books, Summoned by Bells. And as bell ringers, you will be too well acquainted with all of Betjeman, Eliot, Larkin, and other poets' references to bell ringing. And as a church and as a society, we are blessed by the numbers of volunteers who regularly practice during the week and ring our church bells on Sundays both young and old. My father died last year, aged 96, and at his funeral I was welcoming those coming to the service, and I was trying to usher a gentleman at least as old as my father down to a pew at the front of the church when he thanked me for my courtesy and observed that before he could sit down, he had to join his fellow ringers in ringing the bells before the service. So in the future, as now, it will obviously be for the incumbents to discuss and agree with local bell ringers which services and where they will ring the bells, and that will be the same in the future. Nothing will change in that regard. Where church, churches become festival churches and they have a good peal of bells, I see absolutely no reason why in the future we shouldn't have festivals of bell ringing and possibly a diocesan bell ringing festival or local deanery bell ringing festivals where either one tower of bell ringers or a number come together during the course of a day to ring the bells as part of a celebration of church life through bell ringing. And the Association of Festival Churches, which I chair, will certainly very much welcome the involvement and participation of representatives of bell ringers and any other group to ensure that any future work and planning on festival churches, we can maximize the potential and the vitality and viability of those churches that bell ringing can bring. So I'm very grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak here today, and I hope assure you that we are not about to engage on a massive program of closing churches. We are trying to find ways to keep churches open uh, for the 21st century, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for a very erudite uh, discussion. And it really 
brings home a lot of the, the problems which we know Turkey is facing. But uh, I hope that we can play our part in providing ring echo here. Um, uh, anyone wish to ask a question? Hello, Sir Tony. Uh, do you operate with people or can you in conjunction with, say, people like uh, the National Trust or English Heritage concerning church buildings? Yeah. So, um, uh, um, one of the things that I managed to do uh, when I was in the House of Commons um, was in about 2013, um, Richard Charters, then Bishop of London, and myself um, went to see uh, George Osborne, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer. And we said, Chancellor, um, as from next year, 2014, um, cathedrals across the country are going to be commemorating the centenary of the Great War. Um, any chance of some money to uh, help cathedrals ensure that they are in tip-top shape for this? And um, George Osborne looked at me as does any chancellor and said very, you know, well, Tony, no church is going to be, no cathedral is going to be closing for want of some money. And I said, well, actually, Chancellor, uh, Litchfield Cathedral is about to close because they need to rewire and if they can't rewire, they're going to have to close the doors. So somehow, Richard Chartres and I managed to get £20 million out of the Chancellor for cathedrals on that occasion. <laughs> um, emboldened by this, um, I um, bumped into George Osborne coming down the corridor one day. And I said, um, Chancellor, uh, you keep on saying that the um, previous government um, should have repaired the roof whilst the sun was shining. He said, absolutely, Tony, he said, quite right. And I said, well, Chancellor, I've got quite a lot of roofs that need repairing, <laughs> and the sun is shining. Please, can I have some money? And um, so uh, I think, in, you know, as much my cheek as anything, he gave 15 million pounds for a ch church roof repair fund. Um, as you can imagine, 15 million pounds didn't go very far in repairing church roofs. So I went back to the Chancellor again. I said, look, Chancellor, I do not want the joys of exaltation of those who have been given a grant um, for their church roof to be drowned up by the cries of despair of those who applied uh, and were refused. And as all politicians know, actually very often, the noise of those who've been unsuccessful is much louder than the thanks of those who've been successful. So um, in the final budget before I left Parliament in 2015, he gave the church repair fund another 40 million. So by now I'd made 55 million for repairing of church roofs. And then he gave another 20 million um, for cathedrals. So somehow I managed to get 95 million out of them altogether for church buildings. And basically that is where I should have quit. That was, I mean, I was well ahead there. I should have given up then. You know, that was where I should have stopped. Uh, and the point is, I mean, the, the point is that, that the Treasury were kind of outraged about this because I managed to, with the help of the Bishop of London, extract 95 million pounds out of the Chancellor of the Exchequer without any submission, with no bits of paper, no formal, you know, cost-benefit analysis. So um, in a, um, a, a white paper on heritage published by the government about a year ago, um, they announced they were setting up a review group uh, into the uh, sustainability um, of parish church buildings. And uh, this review group is chaired by a very good man called Bernard Taylor, uh, who comes from Oxfordshire, as I do. Um, it's got more nights and dames on, and you know, it's got more nights than a week on it, you know? Uh, Sir Peter Laugh, Sir Tony Baldrige, Sir Simon Jenkins, a lot of dames and so on and so forth. The whole purpose is that the Treasury um, wanted to try and si find some um, format, some form, if they were going to give money out to um, churches, how this might be done. Now, at the moment, there are only um, two um, uh, bits of cent uh, funding for church building. There is the listed places of worship scheme, which was a scheme that's been going for some time to effectively give churches back the cost of the VAT on, on repairs and maintenance, um, which uh, was due to come to an end at the end of 
the last parliament, thinking the last parliament then in, in 2020. And then the National Heritage Lottery Fund have a scheme called the um, Grants for Places of Worship Scheme which they've recently announced they're going to close and merge into another of their schemes. So um, uh, one of the challenges um, for myself and others immediately after the general election, whoever wins uh, is going to have to be sorting out these various um, pots of money. And um, my own view is that in addition to the money for the VAT rebate scheme and the money which is already coming from the Heritage Lottery Fund, we probably each year need at least a further something like 25 million pounds for basic church repair and maintenance. And the Heritage Lottery Fund money, whilst welcome, um, they don't actually give money just for repairs, they give money for projects. And very often churches are having to think up projects, not because they want a project, the only way they're going to money for repairs is by thinking up money for a project. So, um, uh, I mean, this is very much work in progress. English Heritage used to give money for church repairs. They don't do so any longer. So I think once all the noise and alarms and excursions of the general election are out of the way, l in the later part of the summer, you'll probably see in the, you know, the Heritage Press and uh, Church Times and various pieces, articles on the work that I hope I and others will be doing in trying to get the Chancellor Exchequer um, focused on the need to have uh, sustainable funding for um, church repairs and maintenance. Thank you, uh, Sir Tony. You may have answered my question already, but um, you said the 16,000 parish churches that you uh, work with. Uh, does your area of operation extend to cathedrals? No. So there is only so much pain any one person can take. <laughs> and um, the difference is this, that um, the cathedrals effectively have their own um, planning authority, which is called the Cathedral Fabrics Commission. And the Cathedral Fabrics Commission is, a, is the planning authority for the cathedrals. Um, for ch parish churches, we have a, you know, like everything in the Church of England, it is a very curious and complicated system. So the planning authority, um, so parish churches have an ecclesiastical exemption. They're not, the inside of parish churches is not subject to planning law from the local planning authority. So the planning authority is the diocesan chancellor. And the reason the diocesan chancellor got lumbered with this was because historically the diocesan chancellor, as an officer of the bishop, was responsible for ensuring that things like the altar were in the right place, the font was in the right place. And so this naturally progressed into them having responsibility for um, granting faculties for repair and uh, maintenance. And he or she is advised by the diocesan um, advisory uh, committee um, and the Church Buildings Council tries to give advice to both chancellors and to um, DACs. So it is quite a complex um, system. And um, one of the reforms that General Synod agreed in February a couple of years ago was that the Church Buildings Council should be replaced um, by a body called the Church Buildings Commission, which would bring together the work being done by the Church Buildings Council which looks after open churches, and the work which is at present done by the church commissioners, which, look, which has responsibilities for churches that are closed or are closing. So I have part of the responsibility for looking after open churches, but not cathedrals. That is the responsibility of the uh, Cathedral Building Fabrics Commission. Thank you. My particular concern is with churches which are closing. Um, and the process by w once a church has been identified for closure, it's like a dead hand comes down on it. And very often we're denied any sort of access for ringing. And s some dioceses in particular just don't seem to get on and do anything. The, the process as defined should find an alternative use, I think it's two years is the, is what's specified. It never seems to happen. Um, and in the interim, bells are just there and we're not allowed to ring them. Can you give us some hope? 
Well, well that's that I'm maybe the, the processes can be streamlined and yeah. sorted out. Yeah. Well, I think you identify, uh, I mean, I think your point is an extremely good point, which is why I and everyone from Archbishop Justin downwards is very keen that so far as is possible, we don't close churches. But the difficulty is that what I tend to see is um, um, at the moment that churches aren't closed very often on a strategic basis, they're very often closed because you'll have a PCC of a number of people who, you know, elderly just get frustrated, feel they can't carry on the responsibility any longer, and they just literally hand in the keys. They say, we're no longer going to manage this. And then there's a sort of, um, um, there's a sort of horrific inevitability about all this, because as soon as they've said, well, we, we're no longer wanting to keep this open as an open church, um, responsibility falls for it, the building falls to the diocesan board of finance. And the diocesan board of finance, faster than an English three quarter in a match against Wales, passes the ball down the line to the church commissioners. And um, the church commissioners from the 1970s have had the responsibility um, for looking after churches which are closing or, or, or have closed. Now, in some instances, it makes sense to close churches. I mean, there are some unlisted Victorian piles in the center of Manchester, which no one particularly wants. There isn't any congregation left. It makes sense to close them, clear the site, sell the site, and apply the funds to the mission of the work of the Church of England and the diocese elsewhere. The difficulty is, you, as you've outlined, outlined very often, if you've got a grade one or a grade two listed building, um, if you close it, what else can you do with it? Um, and the cost of um, turning um, grade one buildings into anything else, into housing or whatever, is actually incredibly expensive. Um, uh, one of the policy initiatives in the 1970s was to set up the Church's Conservation Trust. And the idea about the Church's Conservation Trust was that um, General Synod each year would put some money into the CCT and government would put some money into the CCT and any grade one listed churches that were redundant but effectively responsibility for them would be handed over to the Church's Conservation Trust. The trouble was, neither, in fairness, did General Synod nor the government maintain the level of funding to the sort of level needed to ensure that every grade one listed church which was made redundant could pass the CCT. I think the Church's Conservation Trust now have responsibilities of about 350 churches, church buildings, redundant church buildings, closed church buildings, they look after them extremely well, um, but their capacity to take on many more is, is pretty limited. So the points you make about the dead hand of a church being formally closed, I think are very well made. And it is again one of the reasons why General Synod wants to have a church building commission, so that there is one body looking after both open and closed churches, so that we can try and ensure that closed churches don't just become rotting um, uh, carcasses of buildings, but can be used wherever possible for things such as bell ringing. If there's something about health and safety, uh, you know, please evacuate, I don't know about, you know, is this a test? You know, it's when they say, you know, um, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I've, um, yeah. I thought actually we're, we're having a new lavatory, a new toilet put into the church at home. And I thought one of the things I would do would be to um, ensure that when it flushes, there's a chorus of the Alleluia chorus, you know. <laughs> I thought that would be, or, or I could get people, rather like with carillons. We have a carillon in St. Mary's Church, Banbury. And I thought we could have a similar thing with a, with, with a loo in St. Mary's Church, Bloxham, where people could sponsor various tunes for when the lavatory flushes to raise to raise money, you know, you could have your own favorite hymn, you know. So, anyway, I shall press on because I'm louder than the alarm, I think.
think there are two parts to that. Um, but firstly, I mean, I think for many, uh, uh, for many church buildings which are used perhaps only for um, a, a few hours on a Sunday or a few hours during the month, um, one of the ways of making them more viable um, is to um, adapt them so that they can be used by the whole community. And actually, loos are quite important because you know, if you've got a local church being in primary school, if, they, if they're loos in the church, um, they can use the church building for all sorts of things. Um, kitchens, um, you know, servers, um, you can use the church for um, uh, lunch clubs, breakfast clubs. Um, so church buildings are being adapted for all sorts of uses and as I go up and down the country. Um, but there is, another, uh, there is another part to your question which is kind of causes me concern, which is this. Um, I do see as I go around the country a, a number of congregations saying, um, look, um, it really is just too expensive uh, maintaining our church. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, why don't we just leave the church and, and set up somewhere else? So, for example, um, St. Luke's Wolverhampton uh, is the, a Georgian church which is most at risk on the Georgian Society's register. It's a grade one listed Victorian church. Um, the congregation said, look, we're just fed up with putting money into maintaining this building, have left it, uh, and now worship in a local school community hall. They've got a Sunday congregation of about 500, um, uh, but of course that's great. They don't have the costs of maintaining a church building, but nor is there a place during the week for people to go and pray or worship. There isn't a central focus for Christian mission um, in that community. And um, uh, there was a new evangelical church opened up recently in Birmingham, which decided not to take over an existing, you know, find an existing church being and building to do that, um, but took over some redundant industrial buildings and have set up a church in, in, in that. So I think we have both to um, enable uh, us to be sensible in adapting existing church buildings for wider community use. And I think we also have to encourage um, very often new evangelical congregations that uh, before they go off and meet in what have hitherto been secular buildings to look at existing church buildings to see whether they can be adapted to their uses. And we, um, as the Church Buildings Council, um, have to uh, do what we can um, to ensure that, that can happen. So I went to, um, you know, it's not my kind of churchmanship, but, you know, but it exists. And it was a, I went to St. Swithin's in Bournemouth the other day, a uh, Sunday morning service, 400 people there, so pretty big congregation. They've kind of church, turned the church completely around, so the chancel has a coffee bar. Um, the actual, what you and I would think of as the altar is somewhere on the south wall on a kind of raised um, heavy metal dais, and you no longer have priests, you have worship leaders. Now, it doesn't as I say, it doesn't speak to my condition, but that's a congregation of 400 people using that church building. Um, so we, as a church buildings council, have to ensure that somehow we get the balance right between um, mission and heritage to enable new congregations to adapt old buildings or existing buildings for worship purposes for the 21st century, if that is what is needed. Okay, now I'm very conscious um, that uh, time is going on. One more question here, yes. Yes. 
So that's a very good question. Let me, let me just repeat it so in case not everyone heard. So the question was, if, there are, if people are contemplating setting up a festival church, um, will there be a formal process that enables bell ringers to think about whether they'd like to be involved in it? And as part of that question, I think there's also the question of, would it be appropriate for some churches almost to be taken over by bell ringers? Uh, can I just say all well, the latter one first? I think in some instances, what we're hoping to do is to have a structure whereby um, uh, ownership of an open church or responsibility of an open church can pass from a PCC to a trust. And uh, this already happens now, but it can only really happen um, with closed churches. So there have been some um, uh, uh, um, uh, closed churches where... Um, and there, there is one in Dorset, and its name will come to me in a moment, which, which had been a, a crusader church, quite a small church, which was closed, and um, a trust took it over, and it's now actually a lot more active than when it was an open church. Um, and I think there's nothing in principle to stop um, churches being used primarily for bell ringing when they became, you know, become a festival church. And indeed, in the centre of Exeter, as one knows, there is a church very near to the cathedral, which is now primarily a church for, for bell ringers. Um, I think your other point about which groups within the diocese are informed and told about um, plans for festival church is a very good one. And um, I think as we start to do uh, more work on um, festival churches, we need to give some thought as to how we promulgate around the diocese and around deaneries what are likely to be uh, festival churches. I certainly hope, I mean, as I say, we've recently set up a national association of festival churches, and I'd certainly welcome um, the involvement of some representatives of bell ringers on, on, on the work we're doing there, um, because in principle there's absolutely no reason um, why those um, involved in bell ringing shouldn't be fully involved in, in determining which are festival churches, because you know, churches with good peals and towers of bells may not necessarily be in exactly the same place where the population decide they want to have worship on a Sunday, but you know, we, we don't want to lose, there may be, we don't want to lose a vital part of being in heritage of that. So yes, we will try and ensure the greatest flexibility, and I will certainly try and ensure um, that um, bell ringers, whether at a diocesan or at a national level, are fully involved in all these plans as we move forward.